Hello, and welcome to Book Spot. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we're going to continue our reading of The Rolling Stones by Robert Heinlein. Chapter 7 In the Gravity Well. A gravity well maneuver involved what appears to be a contradiction in the law of conservation of energy. A ship leaving the moon or a space station for some distant planet can go faster on less fuel by dropping first toward Earth, then performing her principal acceleration while as close to Earth as possible. To be sure, a ship gains kinetic energy, speed, in falling toward Earth, but one would expect that she would lose exactly the same amount of kinetic energy as she coasts away from Earth. The trick lies in the fact that the reactive mass or fuel is itself mass and as such has potential energy of position when the ship leaves the moon. The reactive mass used in accelerating near Earth, that is to say at the bottom of the gravity well, has lost its energy of position by falling down the well. That energy has to go somewhere, and so it does, into the ship as kinetic energy. The ship ends up going faster for the same force and duration of thrust than she possibly could by departing directly from the moon or from a space station. The mathematics of this is somewhat baffling, but it works. Captain Stone put both the boys in the power room for this maneuver and placed Hazel as second pilot. Castor's feelings were hurt, but he did not argue as the last discussion of ship's discipline was still echoing. The pilot had his hands full in this maneuver, leaving it up to the co-pilot to guard the autopilot, to be ready to fire manually if need be, and to watch for Brenschluss. It is the pilot's duty to juggle his ship on her gyros and flywheels with his eyes glued to a measuring telescope, a calostat, to be utterly sure of the extreme limit of the accuracy of his instruments, that his ship is aimed exactly right when the jet fires. In the passage from Earth to Mars, a mistake in angle of one minute of arc, one sixtieth of a degree, will amount to, at the far end, about 15,000 miles. Such mistakes must be paid for in reactive mass by maneuvering to correct, or, if the mistake is large enough, it will be paid for tragically and inexorably with the lives of the captain and crew while the ship plunges endlessly on into the empty depths of space. Roger Stone had a high opinion of the abilities of his twins, but on this touchy occasion, he wanted the co-pilot backing him up to have the steadiness of age and experience. With Hazel riding the other couch, he could give his whole mind to his delicate task. To establish a frame of reference against which to aim his ship, he had three stars, Spica, Deneb, and Formalit, lined up in his scope, their images brought together by prisms. Mars was still out of sight beyond the bulging breast of Earth, nor would it have helped to aim for Mars. The road to Mars is a long curve, not a straight line. One of the images seemed to drift a trifle away from the others. Sweating, he unclutched his gyros and nudged the ship by flywheel. The errant image crept back into position. Doppler, he demanded. In the groove. Time. About a minute, son. Keep your mind on your duck shooting and don't fret. He wiped his hands on his shirt and did not answer. For some seconds, silence obtained. Then Hazel said quietly, unidentified radar beacon blip on the screen, robot response, and a string of numbers. Does it concern us? Closing north and starboard, possible collision course. Roger Stone steeled himself not to look at his own screen. A quick glance would tell him nothing that Hazel had not reported. He kept his face glued to the eye shade of the colostat. Evasive maneuvers indicated, son, you're as likely to dodge into it as duck away from it, too late to figure a ballistic. He forced himself to watch the star images and thought about it. Hazel was right, one did not drive a spaceship by the seat of the pants. At the high speeds and tight curves at the bottom of a gravity well, close up to a planet, an uncalculated maneuver might bring on a collision, or it might throw them into an untenable orbit, one which would never allow them to reach Mars. But what could it be? Not a spaceship, it was unmanned. Not a meteor, it carried a beacon. Not a bomb rocket, it was too high. He noted that the images were steady and stole a glance first at his own screen, which told him nothing, and then through the starboard port. Good heavens, he could see it. A great gleaming star against the black of space, growing, growing. Mind your scope, son, said Hazel. 19 seconds. 
He put his eye back to the scope. The images were steady. Hazel continued, it seems to be drawing ahead slightly. He had to look. As he did so, something flashed up and obscured the starboard port and at once was visible in the port side port, visible but shrinking rapidly. Stone had a momentary impression of a winged torpedo shape. Phew, Hazel sighed. They went that away, partner, she added briskly. All hands brace for acceleration, five seconds. He had his eye on the star images, steady and perfectly matched, as the jet slammed him into his pads. The force was four gravities, much more than the boost from Luna, but they held it for only slightly more than one minute. Captain Stone kept watching the star images, ready to check her. She started to swing, but the extreme care with which he had balanced his ship in loading was rewarded. She held her attitude. He heard Hazel shout, Brenchless, just as the noise and pressure dropped off and died. He took a deep breath and said to the mic, You all right, Edith? Yes, dear, she answered faintly. We're all right. Power room? Okay, Pollux answered. Secure and lock. There was no need to have the power room stand by. Any corrections to course and speed on this leg would be made days or weeks later after much calculation. Aye, aye, sir. Say, Dad, what was that chatter about a blip? Pipe down, Hazel interrupted. I've got a call coming in, she added. Rolling Stone Luna to traffic. Come in, traffic. There was a whir and a click, and a female voice chanted, Traffic control to Rolling Stone Luna. Routine traffic precautionary. Your plan is filed. We'll bring you moderately close to an experimental rocket satellite of Harvard Radiation Laboratory. Hold to flight plan. You will fail contact by ample safety margin. End of message. Repeat. The transcription ran itself through once more and shut off. Now they tell us, Hazel exploded. Oh, those cushion warmers, those bureaucrats. I'll bet that message has been in the holding tank for the past hour waiting for some idiot to finish discussing his missing laundry. She went on fuming. Moderately close, ample safety margin. Why, Roger, that card sign thing singed my eyebrows. A miss is as good as a mile. A mile isn't nearly enough, and you know that darn well. It took 10 years off my life, and at my age, I can't afford that. Roger Stone shrugged. After the strain and excitement, he was feeling let down and terribly weary. Since blast off, he had been running on stimulants instead of sleep. I'm going to cork off for the next 12 hours. Get a preliminary check on our vector. If there's nothing seriously wrong, don't wake me. I'll look at it when I turn out. Aye, aye, Captain Bly. First check showed nothing wrong with their orbit. Hazel followed him to bed. Bed in a figurative sense, for Hazel never strapped herself to her bunk in freefall, preferring to float loosely wherever air currents wafted her. She shared a stateroom with me. The three boys were assigned to the bunk room, and the twins attempted to turn in. But Lowell was not sleepy. He felt fine, and was investigating the wonderful possibilities of freefall. He wanted to play tag. The twins did not want to play tag. Lowell played tag anyhow. Pollock snagged him by an ankle. Listen, you, weren't you enough trouble being sick? I was not sick. So who was it we had to clean up after, Santa Claus? There ain't any Santa Claus. I was not sick. You're a fibber. You're a fibber. You're a fibber. Don't argue with him, Castor advised. Just choke him and stuff him out the lock. We can explain and correct the ship's mass factor tomorrow. I was not sick, Pollock said. Mead had quite a bit of slack time on the leg down. Maybe you can talk her into taking him off our hands? I'll try. Mead was awake. She considered it. Cash? Sis, don't be that way. Well, three days dishwashing? Skinflint, it's a deal. Come and take charge of the body. Mead had to use the bunk room as a nursery. The boys went forward and slept in the control room, each strapped himself loosely to a co control couch as required under ship's regulations to avoid the chance of jostling instruments during sleep. Chapter 8. The Mighty Room. Captain Stone had all hands, with the exception of Dr. Stone and Lowell, compute their new orbits. They all worked from the same data using readings supplied by traffic control and checked against their own instruments. Roger Stone waited until all had finished before comparing results. What did you get, Hazel? So I figure it, Captain. We won't miss Mars by more than a million miles or so. 
I figure it right on. Well, now that you mention it, so do I. Cass, Paul, Mead. The twins were right together to six decimal places and checked with their father and grandmother to five. But Mead's answer bore no resemblance to any of the others. Her father looked it over curiously. Baby girl, I can't figure out how you got this out of the computer. As near as I can tell, you have us headed for Proxima Centauri. Mead looked at it with interest. Is that so? Tell you what, let's use mine and see what happens. It ought to be interesting, but not practical. You have us going faster than light. I thought the figures were a bit large. Hazel stuck out a bony forefinger. That ought to be a minus sign, hon. That's not all she's got wrong, announced Pollux. Look at this. He held out Mead's programming sheet. That'll do, Paul, his father interrupted. You were not called on to criticize Mead's astrogation, but stow it. I don't mind, Daddy, Mead put in. I knew I was wrong, she shrugged. It's the first one I've ever worked outside of school. Somehow it makes it different when it's real. It certainly does, as every astrogator learns. Never mind. Hazel has the median figures. We'll log hers. Hazel shook hands with herself. The winner and still champion. Castor said, Dad, that's final. No more maneuvers until you calculate your approach to Mars? Of course not. No changes for six months at least. Why? Then Paul and I respectfully request the captain's permission to decompress the hold and go outside. We want to get to work on our bikes. Never mind the fake military vessel phraseology, but I have news for you. He took a sheet of paper out of his belt pouch. Just a moment while I make a couple of changes. He wrote on it, then fastened it to the control, control room bulletin board. It read, ship's routine. 0700, Reveille. Optional for Edith, Hazel, and Buster. 0745, breakfast. Mead cooks, twins wash dishes. 0900, school, C&P, math. Mead, astrogation, coached by Hazel. Lowell, reeling, writhing, and fainting in coils, or whatever his mother deems is necessary. 1200, end of morning session. 1215, lunch. 1300, school, C&P, math, hydroponics, chores, mead. 1600, end of afternoon session. 1800, dinner, all hands, initial ship's maintenance schedule. Saturday routine, turn to after breakfast and clean ship, Hazel in charge, captain's inspection at 1100, personal laundry in afternoon. Sunday routine, meditation, study, and recreation, make and mend in afternoon. Hazel looked it over. Where are we headed, Raj Botany Bay? You forgot to set a time to flog the peasants. Seems perfectly reasonable to me. Possibly. Seven gets you ten. It won't last a week. Done. Let's see your money. The twins had read it with dismay. Pollux blurted out, But Dad, you haven't left us any time to repair our bikes. Do you want us to lose our investment? I've assigned 30 hours of study a week. That leaves 138 other hours. How you use them is your business as long as you keep our agreement about studying. Castor said, suppose we want to start math at 8.30 and again right after lunch. Can we get out of school that much earlier? I see no objection. And suppose we study evening sometimes. Can we work up some velvet? Their father shrugged. 30 hours a week, any reasonable variations in the routine will be okay, provided you enter in the log the exact times. Now that that's settled, Hazel commenced, I regret to inform you, Captain, that there is one other little item on that Procrustean program that will have to be canceled, at least for the time being. Much as I would enjoy inducting our little blossom into the mysteries of astrogation, I don't have the time right now. You'll have to teach her yourself. Why? Why, the man asks. You should know better than anyone. The scourge of the spaceways, that's why. I've got to hole up and write like mad for the next three or four weeks. I've got to get several months of episodes ahead before we get out of radio range. Roger Stone looked at his mother sadly. I knew it was bound to come, Hazel, but I didn't expect it to hit you so young. The mental process is dull. The mind tends to wander. The Whose mind does what? Why, you young, take it easy. If you'll look over your left shoulder out the starboard port and squint your eyes, you might imagine you can see a glint on the war god. It can't be much over 10,000 miles away. What's that got to do with me? She demanded suspiciously. 
poor Hazel. We'll take good care of you, mother. We're riding in orbit with several large commercial vessels. Every one of them has burners powerful enough to punch through to Earth. We won't ever be out of radio contact with Earth. Hazel stared out the port as if she could actually spot the war god. Well, I'll be dogged, she breathed. Roger, lead me to my room. There's a good boy. It's senile decay, all right. You'd better take back your show. I doubt if I can write it. Huh. Uh uh, you let him pick up that option, you've got to write it. Speaking of the scum of the waste spaces, I've been meaning to ask you a couple of questions about it, and this is the first spare moment we've had. In the first place, why did you let them sign us up again? Because they waved too much money under my nose, as you know full well. It's an aroma we stones have hardly ever been able to resist. I just wanted to make you admit it. You were going to get me off the hook, remember? So you swallowed it yourself. More bait. Surely. Now the other point. I don't see how you dared to go ahead with it, no matter how much money they offered. The last episode you showed me, while you had killed off the Galactic Overlord, you had also left our hero in a decidedly untenable position. Sealed in a radioactive sphere, if I remember correctly, at the bottom of an ammonia ocean on Jupiter. The ocean was swarming with methane monsters, whatever they are, each hypnotized by the Overlord's mind ray to go after John Sterling at the first whiff, and him armed with only his scout knife. How did you get him out of that one? We found a way, put in Paul. If you assume quiet, infants, nothing to it, Roger. By dint of super superhuman effort, our hero extricated himself from his predicament, and that's no answer. You don't understand. I open the next episode on Ganymede. John Sterling is telling Special Agent Dolores O'Shanahan about his adventure. He's making light of it, see? He's noble, so he really wouldn't want to boast to a girl. Just as he is jokingly disparaging his master, masterly escape, the next action starts, and it's so fast and violent and so bloody that our unseen audience doesn't have time to think about it until the commercial. And by then, they've got too much else to think about. Roger shook his head. That's literary cheating. Who says this is literature? I've got three new sponsors. Hazel, asked Pollux, where have you got them now? What's the situation? Hazel glanced at the chronometer. Roger, does that schedule take effect today, or can we start fresh tomorrow? He smiled feebly. Tomorrow, I guess. If this is going to degenerate into a story conference, I'd better get Lowell. I have get my best ideas from Lowell. He's just the mental age of my average audience. If I were Buster, I would resent that. Quiet. She slithered to the hatch and called out, Edith, may I borrow your wild animal for a while? Meade said, I'll get him, Grandmother, but wait for me. She returned quickly with the child. Lowell said, What do you want, Grandma Hazel? Bounce tag? She gathered him in an arm. No, son, blood. Blood and gore. We're going to kill off some villains. Swell! Now, as I recall it, and mind you, I was only there once, I left them lost in the dark nebula. Their food is gone, and so is their Q fuel. They've made a temporary truce with their Arcturian prisoners and set them free to help, which is safe enough because they're silicone chemistry people and can't eat humans, which is about what they're down to. The real question is, who gets barbecued for lunch? They need the help of the Arcturian prisoners because the space entity they captured in the last episode and imprisoned in an empty fuel tank has eaten its way through all but the last bulkhead, and it doesn't have any silly prejudices about body chemistry, carbon or silicon, it's all one to it. I don't believe that's logical, commented Roger Stone. If its own chemistry was based out of order, ruled Hazel. Helpful suggestions only, please. Paul, you seem to have a gleam in your eye. This space entity jigger, can he stand up against radar wavelengths? Now we're getting somewhere, but we've got to complicate things a bit. Well, Mead? The twins started moving their bicycles outside the following day. The suits they wore were the same ones they had worn outdoors on the moon, with the addition of magnetic boots and small rocket motors. These latter were strapped to their backs with the nozzles sticking straight from their waists. An added pressure bottle to supply the personal rocket motor was mounted on the shoulders of each boy, but being weightless, the additional mass was little handicap. Now remember, their father warned them, those boost units are strictly for dire emergencies, lifelines at all times, and don't depend on your boots when you shift lines. Snap on the second line before you loose the first. Shucks, Dad, we'll be careful, no doubt, but you can expect me to make a surprise inspection at any time. One slip on a safety precaution, and it's the rack and thumb screws, plus 50 strokes of the bastinado. No boiling oil? Can't afford it. 
See here, you think I'm joking. If one of you should happen to get loose and drift away from the ship, don't expect me to come after you. One of you is spare anyway. Which one? asked Pollux. Cass, maybe? Sometimes I think it's one, sometimes the other. Strict compliance with the ship's orders will keep me from having to decide at this time. The cargo hatch had no airlock. The Quins decompressed the entire hold, then opened the door, remembering just in time to snap on their lines as the door opened. They looked out and both hesitated. Despite their lifelong experience with vacuum suits on the face of the moon, this was the first time either one had ever been outside a ship in orbit. The hatch framed endless cosmic night, blackness made colder and darker by the unwinking diamond stars many light years away. They were on the night side of the stone. There was nothing but stars and the swallowing depths. It was one thing to see it from the safety of Luna or through the strong quartz of a port. It was quite another to see it with nothing at all between one's frail body and the giddy cold depths of eternity. Pollock said, Cass, I don't like this. There's nothing to be afraid of. Then why are my teeth chattering? Go ahead, I'll keep attention on your line. You are too good to me, dear brother. A darn sight too good. You go and I'll keep tension on your line. Don't be silly. Get on out there. After you, Grandpa. Oh, well. Castor grasped the frame of the hatch and swung himself out. He scrambled to click his magnetic boots to the side of the ship, but the position was most awkward. The suit was cumbersome and he had no gravity to help him. Instead, he swung around and his momentum pulled his fingers loose from the smooth frame. His floundering motions bumped the side of the ship and pushed him gently away. He floated out, still floundering, until his line checked him three or four feet from the side. Pull me in! Put your feet down, clumsy! I can't! Pull, pull me in, you red-headed moron! Don't call me red-headed! Pollux let out a couple of feet more line. Paul, quit fooling! I don't like this! I thought you were brave, Grandpa. Castor's reply was incoherent. Pollux decided that it had gone far enough. He pulled Castor in, and while firmly holding to a hatch dog himself, he grabbed one of Castor's boots and set it firmly against the side. It clicked into place. Snap on your other line, he ordered. Castor, still breathing heavily, looked for a pad eye on the side of the ship. He found one nearby and walked over to it, picking up his feet as if he walked in sticky mud. He snapped his second line to the ring of the pad eye and straightened up. Catch, Pollux called out and sent his own second line snaking out to his twin. Castor caught it and fastened it beside his own. All set, asked Pollux. I'm going to unsnap us in here. All secure, Castor moved closer to the hatch. Here I come. So you do. Castor gave Pollux's line a tug. Pollux came sailing out of the hatch and Castor let him keep on sailing. Castor checked the line gently through his fingers, soaking up the momentum so that Pollux reached the end of the 50-foot line and stayed there without bouncing back. Pollux had been quite busy on the way out, but to no effect. Sawing vacuum is futile. When he felt himself snubbed to a stop, he quit struggling. Pull me back! Say, uncle. Pollux said several other things, some of which he had picked up dockside on Luna, some much more colorful expressions derived from his grandmother. You had better get off this ship, he concluded, because I'm coming down this line and take your helmet off. He made a swipe for the line with one hand. Castor flipped it away. Say even Stephen then. Pollux had the line now, having remembered to reach for his belt where it was hooked instead of grabbing for the bite. Suddenly he grinned. Okay, even Stephen. Even Stephen it is. Hold still, I'll bring you in. He towed him in gently, grabbing Paul's feet and clicking them down as he approached. You looked mighty silly out there, he commented when Pollux was firm to the ship's side. His twin invoked their ritual. Even Stephen. My apologies, Junior. Let's get to work. Pad eyes were spaced about 20 feet apart all over the skin of the ship. They had been intended for convenience in rigging during overhauls and to facilitate outside inspections while underway. The twins now used them to park bicycles. They removed the bicycles from the hold half a dozen at a time, strung on a wire loop like a catch of fish. They fastened each clutch of bikes to a pad eye. The machines floated loosely out from the side like boats tied to an ocean ship. 
stringing the clusters of bicycles shortly took them over the horizon to the day side of the ship. Pollux was in front, carrying six bicycles in his left hand. He stopped suddenly. Hey, Grandpa, get a load of this. Don't look at the sun, Castor said sharply. Don't be silly, but come see this. Earth and moon swam in the middle distance in slender crescent phase. The stone was slowly dropping behind Earth in her orbit, even more slowly drifting outward from the sun. For many weeks yet, Earth would appear as a ball, a disk, before distance cut her down to a brilliant star. Now she appeared about as large as she had from Luna, but she was attended by Luna herself. Her day side was green and blue and lavished with cottony clouds. Her night side showed the jewels of cities. But the boys were paying no attention to Earth. They were looking at the moon. Pollux sighed. Isn't she beautiful? What's the matter, Junior? Homesick? No, but she's beautiful just the same. Look, Cass, whatever ships we own, let's always register them out of Luna City, home base. Suits? Can you make out the berg? I think so. Probably just a spot on your helmet. I can't. Let's get back to work. They had used all the pad eyes conveniently close to the hatch and were working aft when Pollock said, Whoops, take it easy. Dad said not to go aft of frame 65. Shucks, it must be cool back to 90 at least. We've used the jets less than five minutes. Don't be too sure. Neutrons are slippery customers, and you know what a stickler dad is anyway. He certainly is, said a third voice. They did not jump out of their boots because they were zipped tight. Instead, they turned around and saw their father standing, hands on hips, near the passenger airlock. Pollux gulped and said, Howdy, Dad. You sure gave us a start, Castor added sheepishly. Sorry, but don't let me disturb you. I just came out to enjoy the view. He looked over their work. You've certainly got my ship looking like a junkyard. Well, we had to have room to work. Anyhow, who's to see? In this location, you have the Almighty staring down the back of your neck but I don't suppose he'll mind. Say, Dad, Paul and I sort of guessed that you wouldn't want us to do any welding inside the hold. You sort of guessed correctly, not after what happened in the Kong Christian. So we figured we could jury rig a rack for welding out here, okay? Okay, but it's too nice a day to talk business. He raised his open hands to the stars and looked out. Swell place, lots of elbow room, good scenery. That's the truth, but come around to the sun side if you want to see something else. Right, here, help me shift my lines. They walked around the hull into the sunlight. Captain Stone, Earthborn, looked first at the mother planet. Looks like a big storm is working up around the Philippines. Neither of the twins answered. Weather was largely a mystery to them, nor did they approve of weather. Presently, he turned to them and said softly, I'm glad we came, boys. Are you? Oh, you bet, sure. They had forgotten how cold and unfriendly the black depths around them had seemed only a short time before. Now it was an enormous room, furnished in splendor, though not yet fully inhabited. It was their own room to live in, to do with as they liked. They stood there for quite a long time enjoying it. At last, Captain Stone said, I've had all the sun I can stand for a while. Let's work around back into the shade. He shook his head to dislodge a job of sweat from his nose. We ought to get back to work anyhow. I'll help you. We'll get done faster. And we'll follow the family stone further along their orbit to Mars next time.